Well, good evening. And um, I know I speak for all in saying thank you, Robin, for such a wonderful lecture. I'm hoping that you in the audience will have a burning question that Robin's lecture has provoked. And I'm going to give you a good minute to think about what that burning question is while I just turn to put Robin's lecture in a little bit of context to each of our two panelists. So let me turn first to Mr. Harpal Singh, who, in addition to his private sector work, is chairman of Save the Children in India and sits on the board of Save the Children International. In fact, he directs the board of Save the Children International. Um, Harpal, much has been said about um, different progress that needs to be made in health care in India. But India's current prime minister has focused on, in a way, a more modest goal, which is the provision of toilets within walking distance of Indian households, the provision of clean drinking water in walking distance of households across India. When you look at the whole of India, that looks like a big challenge. But how do you see that? Do, would you focus on that? Or would you focus as the goal on universal health coverage or on new discoveries and new implementation technologies? Well, uh, uh, you know, to address the, the full sort of healthcare agenda of the country, clearly speaking, is not something that we will complete in, in five or 10 years. It's obviously a long-term story. But I think there's an interesting comment in, the, in, in what the Prime Minister has said and your question which is that really if you look at the entire arena of prevention, which somehow has, and to the knowledge of everybody, incidentally experts and simple citizens, that if you focus on prevention, and I think uh, Robin also sort of alluded to that, that in spite of the fact that we are well aware that prevention can have a huge multiplier on the health burden on, on a country, and yet, uh, surprisingly, I heard from the comment that the UK spends only 4% of its total spend on healthcare in the arena of prevention. I suspect in India we spend much lesser than that as well. So, um, and then if you combine it with the fact that 70% of the bed capacity of Indian healthcare today is actually taken up by waterborne disease. Mm -hmm. So you give clean water and you improve sanitation the multiplier effects are tremendous. So I think the Prime Minister is spot on um, that, that in terms of priority and in terms of getting the population to, to move and to understand the importance of, uh, of, of clean water and of good sanitation, I think is, 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 is very timely and very appropriate. But I hope he follows it up with providing the necessary resources to make that happen. And I think that's where, uh, again, the big challenge is it's not so much the knowledge of, of what is to be done, uh, which is important, but as again alluded to by uh, Robin in her comments, where we really need a lot of focus is on implementation science. How do we just implement better? And I think therefore, uh, clearly speaking, that's, that's important, but how well we implement those programs will really answer how well we address the challenge actually. Great. Um, You've mentioned government, and Keshav Deviraju, sitting here, has spent a year as Secretary of Health, 2013. Take us into that room for a minute, because I don't think anyone else in the room, I might be wrong, but I don't think anyone else in the room has, has had that year as Secretary of Health. If you could, what, what is it that you most regret you were not able to do as Secretary of Health? Well, that's a very long list. But what, what would stand uh, out? Uh, one thing that I particularly regret not being able to complete was to put the final seal on uh, India's new mental health legislation. It was a process I piloted through four years in the ministry. And 90% of the job is done. Did, did, would you like me to ask the secretary to repeat that? Yes. Yeah. Could you start again? I, I, yes. I was saying the answer to Nairi's question is it, it's a very long list. But one particular regret is I was unable to bring to completion the work that was begun in 2010 in rewriting India's mental health legislation. 
90% of the job is done and it is in Parliament. But I would have been very pleased to have seen it a done deal before I left that room. And what will that do? I mean, will it go through, do you think? Or, or is it now? Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. And, and what will it do? Well, it was remarkable legislation only in, I, I say in if I say so myself, because it really brings the person with mental illness into, into focus and recognizes the rights of the person with illness at all times. The legislation includes some remarkable provisions such as, for instance, an advance directive that any, any person with or without illness would be enabled through the new act to leave a statement in one of many forms of how he or she wished to be treated in the event of incapacitation or illness. That, I, that is actually, uh, it, would have, it would have gone a great deal towards reforming many of the abuses which take place in the mental health world today. Let me also add, in India, 10% of the population is believed to have common mental disorder. 3%, 3% has serious mental disorder. 3% is about 40 million people with serious mental disorder. Uh, so these are staggering numbers. And um, uh, if I could just say here, I, I do believe that the, the most lasting solutions are the ones that come through measures such as legislation, because uh, there's a great deal to be done here and now, and there are many things that, many problems that call for immediate solutions. But one must always think about what can one put in place that will take care of a problem in the long term. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Robin told us in her lecture about the demographic shift and the increase in dementia in society. So it's a, it's a forward-looking piece Absolutely. of legislation. It is extremely forward-looking piece of legislation, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Just before I turn to the audience for their questions, um, Harpal, Robin you know, made a strong case for why we need the private sector, government, entrepreneurs, um, civil society to join together to deliver health um, in this country. You, you're Emeritus Chairman of Fortis Healthcare. Speaking frankly among friends, and now that you're Emeritus, mm -hmm. what is it that you think the private sector could do better, and what is it that the private sector should stop doing? In order, I mean, Robin cited 70% of healthcare in India is delivered by the private sector. So what, what would you tell just this exclusive group of friends that, you know, what, what is it you could, that the, that the private providers, you know, if you could shake them up, you'd have them doing better? Well, a, a sort of a couple of points. Uh, if you go back 25 years, it didn't matter how much or how well you were, were off in terms of financial terms. A majority of Indians who were well-to-do traveled overseas for high-end medical care. And, and that reality has changed dramatically over the last 25 years in that, that we still have the well-to-do or the very extremely well-to-do travel overseas, but a very large number of them now are able to get high-quality health care to global standards in India. And I dare say, based on some of the foundational work by, done by some of the government institutes, the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences, the Institutes of uh, Medic Medicine in South India. Based on that foundation, I think the private sector has grown immensely over the last 20 years. I mean, an example of our own company, we opened our first hospital just in 2001, and in a short 13 years, we are 65 hospitals. And that sort of, in a sense, also uh, uh, answers that it is possible to do things dramatically different and to a dramatic pace in India. Um, I think in terms of uh, addressing the healthcare agenda of the country, and I think very sharply brought out by the challenge in, in Robin's uh, lecture, this is not something that would be done by any one of the single sectors alone, be it government, be it the private sector, or the not-for-profit sector. It's obviously something that has to be done in a great grand partnership between these three uh, sectors. And a fourth one, which she brings out rather strongly, is the fourth big partner in this has to be the, sim the citizen. Mm -hmm. So I think this has to be a collective partnership. 
What we do need is that if you look at those three sectors, there is currently a great amount of what I would call a sort of a trust deficit between these three entities. Uh, each one thinks of the other as not doing appropriately correct things, and it is also true that there are things that are done by each one of those, incidentally, including government uh, and the private sector, where we need to improve our, uh, our standards and in the nature of services that we render. So certainly, I think improvements are necessary. I think practices uh, across the board, it doesn't matter whether you're in government, whether you're in the private sector, or whether you're in the not-for-profit sector, I think the practices that, 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 that the citizen has to face, uh, some alarmingly unacceptable to, uh, to, uh, uh, to others that are good, but I think we need to improve the practices. And if I may say that innovation is required not only in the, in the, in the products that we offer, uh, but in the processes itself, there's a remarkable amount of innovation. If you look at the dollars spent or the rupees spent on, let's say, high-end technology in India by the private sector and its outcomes in terms of its productivity and the same rupees spent in the government sector, I suspect you will see a huge productivity gap. Mm -hmm. And I think the ability to bring the productivity efficiencies of the private sector into government functioning would be a great opportunity for engaging and, and delivering. Um, but the, can, I just, can I just press you on the one yeah. thing? What is it, in what way, if you were really trying to get the different sectors in India to step up the game in a whole new way, what is it that the private sector could do that they're not doing at the moment? Well, I would say, uh, uh, you know, if the private sector was to, uh, the, the health sector incidentally is supposed to grow at about 15% per annum. Mm -hmm. and that's a pretty aggressive growth rate. Uh, by 2026, $160 billion worth of uh, a sector. If the private sector were to continue to deliver mm -hmm. high quality services in arenas where it is currently operating, mm -hmm. and my sense is, again, I have to look at it in, in its sort of entirety, say, if you look at 80% of the health demands of the citizen, mm -hmm. they are actually quite handsomely serviced by primary and secondary care. Mm -hmm. The private sector has not been able to as yet find adequate models of success to deal in the arena of primary care. And I'm not so sure that we should necessarily, necessarily, I'm not saying there won't be some good success uh, uh, models as well, but this is the arena of partnership. If government could focus on addressing the needs of 80% of the health burden, which is the primary and the secondary level, and, and partner with the private sector to do the tertiary side, which is capital intensive, but there the private sector has demonstrated an ability to produce very high quality services. Uh, that I think is a great opportunity. But the private sector could also, because it's a very large sector, mm -hmm. we have the high end, very organized sector, and then we have the simple doctor who uh, is a private practitioner in remote India. And I dare say that some of the practices there are practices that, that uh, as I said earlier on, are quite unacceptable, uh, uh, and and uh, and many many of us, the, the the average citizen faces the full brunt of these unacceptable practices. And and, and Keshav, if you were still Secretary of Health, is there anything specific that you would like I, to see the private sector doing that it's not already doing? Well, they could reduce costs to start with. <laughs> uh, no, but I need to come into what Tarpal Singh was saying. Yep. Uh, clearly. This has to be, and I like the term, a grand partnership between government, the private sector, the community. In a resource poor country, we have to draw in private resources into meeting, if we need to get towards universal health care. But the fundamental change has to happen in government services. Mm -hmm. uh, you use, sir, the phrase 80% of the population is handsomely served by the primary and secondary services. That is not actually true. Uh, the quality and level of services at the primary and secondary level. Well, India has an enormous variation. Some states are pretty good. Tamil Nadu is excellent. 
But once you come into the badlands of North India, it is really, it's, it, it, you do not get any quality of service. The huge change, and that's where I see what Professor Norton says, the application of science and te technology and entrepreneurship needs to come in to make government do better. Government needs to work better. Government institutions need to deliver better. And what again, what Mr. Singh said, a private sector mode of functioning where every rupee counts, where every rupee needs, shows up on the balance sheet. That, I think we need to see, I have no fear for the private sector in India's health space, but I fear enormously for the public sector. That's where we need to say, see the transformative change happening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Music to the ears of a dean of a school of government. And, of course, our brilliant Indian students, some of whom are here, I hope, will come and help take that forward. Now, your questions. Who, who has a burning question? At the back, please. Now, there's uh, quite a few of you with questions. So I'm going to take short, sharp, sweet questions, and I'm going to take several so, yes. Sir. I have a quick burning question. Sorry, could you tell us who you are? Vivek Just Kataria. And Thank I you. did go to the right university, and I'm happy to see that there is a collaboration between Oxford and India uh, on the healthcare space. Since this is India, and of course we have many visitors here t this evening, this might strike a chord with a lot of us Indians. My grandmother passed away at age 102, five years ago. And she always talked about how she'd spent her life eating food with ghee. Ghee is, I presume you know, hydrogenated oil or you know, solidified oil. This sort of resonated with an article I read in the Time magazine in June, where they talked, where the cover story was eat butter. I'm sure many people read that. So two questions. One is I'm curious to know maybe Robin's uh, uh, view on this Time magazine article of eating butter and my grandmother's recommendations to eat ghee. And B, on a more serious note, um, you know, is Oxford also collaborate, collaborating with India on not just our grandmother tales of, um, you know, how we, the dietary choices that we made, but also uh, our traditional um, um, health, you know, the Ayurveda and the, the homeopathic uh, techniques that we seem to have sort of Excellent. not necessarily um, got very well scientifically entrenched in the world today. Thank you very much. Um, at the back there. This is to the speaker and Kesha both. Uh, your lecture was largely focused on uh, all the collaboration that you mentioned on uh, disease like cancer, mental health, cardiac uh, problems. Uh, one of the major problems faces India and the rest of the world, India more so, is the antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. The case is argued, it's been discussed, the problem is in front of us, it probably is the biggest problem uh, as far as we are concerned, emergence of multiple drug resistance, tuberculosis, et cetera. Here is a problem which is both delivery as well as governance. So maybe Keshav and both of you can address it. Considering penicillin was discovered in Oxford, I thought it rather striking that you didn't mention anything about antibiotic resistance. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, this gentleman here, if you can bring the microphone. Ladies in the audience, I hope I don't have to give you permission to ask a question, but, you know, I'm looking for you out there, so please. Um, so first the gentleman at the back, and then I'm going to come to the gentleman at the front. Hi. Uh, my name is Dr. Ghosh Dastidar, and I studied uh, reproductive medicine at Oxford. This question uh, is addressed to both Professor Norton as well as, uh, in fact, to Professor Hamilton, though I know he's not on the panel. Uh, I studied re reproductive medicine at Oxford and I'm a working physician in India right now. I wonder, in the health healthcare space, which relates specifically to reproductive medicine, fertility uh, treatments, if a young uh, working professional, scientist such as me, such as I am working right now, has certain innovative ideas to engage in this sphere of technology uh, development. Could Oxford help in any sort of collaboration and how to go about that? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, thank you. And then up to the front, yes, sir, <coughs> in the yellow shirt. Uh, yeah. Dr. Alu Alia from Indian Consul of Medical Research. I look after health systems research at ICMR headquarters. 
my question is to Dr. Singh. Sir, you have talked about the uh, tertiary care taken care of by the private sector. That's true. I see uh, during the uh, 11th five-year plan, the public sector was, uh, government was spending only 0.9% of their GDP, while 3.6% used to come from the private sector. But the private sector is only contributing towards tertiary care. While the primary sector is too important, the, the contribution of private sector to primary health care is almost negligible when the private sector will take care of their social corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then the lady two along from you. If you could pass the microphone that way. Yes. I'm Renu Singh from Young Lives India. Thank you, Robin, for that lecture. Uh, I want to just turn to Mr. Deshra, Dr. Uh, Mr. Deshraj, who based on what you just said about the fact that there is an increase in mental he health issues uh, across the, you know, the, the world in, and in India as well. And you mentioned, sir, that there are three uh, percent people you think have mental health issues. The census just came out with 3% as having persons with disability in the whole country. If we don't count the people, how are we even going to plan to have interventions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then over this side, which I've been sorely neglecting. Yes, here in the front. Uh, my name is Sudarshan. I work as the dean of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy. Uh, my question concerns uh, the role of uh, uh, social entrepreneurship or what a uh, social enterprise in the area of health. It seems to me, and this is troubling me, that um, uh, governments uh, in many countries are sort of abdicating their responsibility to citizens and seem to think that uh, it should be possible to encourage a whole lot of uh, private capital uh, from people with huge net worth uh, to come and contribute to um, causes that uh, are advancing the public good. Um, but it seems to me that anyone investing um, in anything um, uh, by way of an enterprise will expect a reasonable rate of return. And, and the social good that may come of it is incidental. It's the rate of return that matters. Um, and in that circumstance, I think this stress on uh, social entrepreneurship in this, uh, at this time, uh, particularly in the case of India where, as Kesha pointed out, there's so much more that uh, needs to be done to improve what government is doing. Um, and to, I'm concerned that this might become a kind of a fad or a fashion that, oh yes, the government, minimum government means uh, calling upon social entrepreneurs to come into the health sector is worrying me and I'd like reactions to my concerns. Thank you very much. And then the lady at the back there, yes. Um, hi, I'm Bidisha. I work with the UK Government for International, um, Department for International Development. My question is really non-technical. Uh, so it's more on uh, the demand side and the health-seeking behavior side. And we've heard a lot about service and service provision and what the government and private sector can do, and that's fear. But if we don't have uh, a population who are who want to be healthy and who are aware of how to be healthy and know where to go to get those services, we're not going to get very far. So to all the panelists, what do you see as the role of the private sector or the government or even research and evidence in what has worked and how can we move that forward? Great. I'm now going to come back to our panelists, but with a promise that those of you who still have questions get a chance to ask them to all of us over wine and drinks immediately um, this panel ends, so we look forward to that. Um, let's take these questions. I mean, there's real concern from the audience um, about primary health in particular, um, antibiotic resistance, um, perhaps as part of that, um, the mental health issues that were raised. Um, Robin, is, it, is your recipe of technology science and innovation relevant to all of them, or are you thinking specifically of just the secondary sector? What, tell, us, tell us about whether you agree with these priorities that the audience are putting and, and whether your solutions can work for them. Well, firstly, just to, the, the issue about antibiotics and resistance. Um, 
obviously I can't cover everything when we talk about healthcare and I've focused on what I know best and there are certainly others at the University of Oxford who could address those sorts of concerns. But perhaps to move on to some of the issues around prevention, which as I've said and I think the panellists will agree, is, um, it should be a key focus of what we look at. Um, science is going to be important in there, technology is going to be important in there, and entrepreneurship. And I, I don't think, I, I hope what I put across here is it's not just entrepreneurs. We must work with government. Indeed, my examples show where we do work with government and what we do. A couple of the issues that came up around food policy. The whole issue of food um, is all part of that pre prevention spectrum. We need to have a major focus here, and indeed I could have talked about some of the work that we're at the Georgia involved in, particularly around looking at salt, for example. Um, how do we, at the George, we're working with the government to look at how they develop a policy around salt. Um, mental health, we've talked about before, the Georges very much sees that mental health should be on the agenda, the prevention agenda. So and I, I think just the other comment that came back right at the end, which does re relate to prevention, is really around this issue of health literacy. And I just want to come back to my plug um, towards the end, which is really about a focus on children and adolescents we really should focus on that group if we're interested in health literacy and prevention if, if we want to make a difference in the future. Now, I have some sympathy with, with, with the people on the government side in this. Salt, mental health, antibiotic resistance, primary, secondary, hospital, but there's a whole lot for every country on the health menu. But if Prime Minister Modi said to you, Robin, what's the one thing that I should most prioritise for health in India, what would your answer be? Well, if I Not as a panacea, but, but given this hugely complex terrain, is there one thing that stands out as an important first step? If I use my injury background hat, I would say that the Prime Minister has done some great initiatives just recently where he's focusing on the need for greater legislation to reduce road traffic injuries. Mm -hmm. So I think that's fantastic that he's done it. So he's done it now, as long as they ensure that there is enforcement of that legislation that he's wanting to put in place. And just to explain that to the audience, road traffic injuries, okay, now another one. Is that because it's a larger cause of death than heart disease, or just tell us no, why? No, it's not a larger cause of death, but it's, a, well, it is amongst the adolescent population. Okay. But road traffic injuries, about 10% of the population of the world dies from road traffic injuries. And the government of India, the Prime Minister has recognised that it is an important cause of death. Mm -hmm. And we know so much from the rest of the world that we can reduce road traffic injuries mm -hmm. through legislation. So he is to be applauded for doing that already. But I guess my passion comes back to the children and adolescents as well that I think if we can put more effort into the child and adolescent population and particularly focusing on the issues of relevance for children and adolescent mental health, injuries, and that is the time at which young people initiate many of those behaviours that lead to future chronic disease. So that would be where Good. I'd put my money. Thank you. Um, Harpal, there's been a, a call both from your fellow panellist and from at least one of the audience on the private sector engaging more in primary health. Is that possible? How? Um, so a couple of things. One is that uh, there's no question. I mean, if you've seen the movement of what's happened over the last 20, 25 years, we address the, we, we've come up with fairly successful, if I may say, business models at the tertiary level. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a good growth in that arena. I think the real primary uh, 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 response in the primary area will actually come through technology. And the use of uh, now, we are already doing that uh, in our own group, for instance, we run the largest diagnostic system in the country. Mm -hmm. And we, um, 
carry samples from the most remote areas, bring them to centralized laboratories, uh, do the tests, and send back the results electronically in time, in time spans and quality standards that physicians find acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so actually, the, the number of that, and as, as the application of uh, these uh, technologies become mm -hmm. more pervasive, I suspect that we will find more and more. We're beginning to do this in imaging. Uh, again, uh, there are uh, initiatives that, for instance, connect some of the northeastern states for imaging technology, uh, where CTs and X-rays are done in remote areas by, incidentally, uh, just technicians. Mm -hmm. But then the, the images are fed to central systems where doctors and physicians can give immediate responses. So, as so I see this yeah. happening. I see this yeah. happening uh, 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 as we go along and as I think the use of technology becomes more pervasive. And, and cheaper. And so will, will the private sector's provision of, of diagnostics become cheaper and cheaper, or will private sector practice in this area become more and more profitable? Well, I can tell you this, that today we are offering diagnostics in pathology, for instance, yep. uh, at costs that are very competitive to what local laboratories are giving. Mm -hmm. So we've sharply brought down costs there by the application of technology, and I see that happening in, in greater measure as we go along. So yes, I think they, we will see, and also uh, the wonderful innovative stuff that is happening on, on, on uh, insurance, in, in, in uh, rural insurance schemes. And I think the availability of insurance funding will again make primary, uh, 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 the private sector more responsive to the needs in, the, in that side. But you know, uh, I mean, other than just to say, why is the primary sector not there? Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that really speaking, if at all real dramatic changes to be got, there's no reason why the government sector cannot deliver much, much better at the primary level. It's not to say this or that, mm -hmm. but it is to say that really speaking, the government already has a very substantive, mm -hmm. substantive infrastructure that goes right down to remote India. And, and I think to activate that, mm -hmm. and I think partnerships there would be most useful. Mm -hmm. For instance, this physical presence in, 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 in deep into districts. Uh, now, how can the private sector partner with these infrastructures to improve the quality of delivery and the quality of care? That's where the partnerships, I think, would become very useful. And what would be the one feasible first step that you would ask the Prime Minister to take? Well, I think I would go back to what he's already sort of announced, and my concern, again, is, is that it's not so much as the announcing of a great initiative, which is sanitation and clean water, uh, simply for the fact that it has such a huge multiplier. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, combined with a uh, real focus on nutrition, mm -hmm. because malnourishment and its attendant effects on, on, on uh, stunting mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is huge implications for the future for the population. Mm -hmm. And I think, th therefore, the three things that I would say would require Huge, should require huge focus and certainly should come out of this 4% of spending only out of the total health budget is clean water, sanitation, nutrition. Mm -hmm. Secretary Dizaraju, were those three things in your in-tray as health secretary or are they sitting in someone else's in-tray? Uh, no, they were very much in the in-tray but I would second Harpal Singh so when he says that uh, perhaps their role as contributing to preventing ill health was not so well understood. Mm -hmm. But since I have the mic, can I just respond very quickly to two of the questions? There was a question here on the census regarding disability figures. This, madam, is part of a much larger debate on whether mental illness is or is not a disability. And you will find that the mental health activists and the disability activists are at loggerheads on this question. So it is quite likely that what the census has covered is really only physical disability. And it's also quite possible that mental illness is not reported as a disability during the census process. And Sudarshan's question on social entrepreneurship, I do see, of course, there is no question of government abdicating its responsibility or outsourcing it in any sense. And I would like to understand social entrepreneurship uh, in a slightly different sense, uh, to pick up the case that uh, Professor Norton gave of 
Dr. Venkat Swami in the Aravind Eye Hospital, I see as a remarkable example of social entrepreneurship. Or if you look at the Jan Swast Sahyog in Bilaspur in Chhattisgarh, or the Banyan again in Chennai, or the work of the Dr. Abhay and Rani Bang in Gadchiroli, these are remarkable experiments in social entrepreneurship, but it comes with the caveat that these are also the result of transformative personalities. None of these examples are replicable because there are extraordinary individuals who have managed to grow much bigger than their surroundings in some way and put through transformative change. But that change is not going to happen if they were not there. So I think that still leaves us with the question of who, and who is going to generate the transformative change and where is the lubricant that is going to keep us moving into the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we will have to close. I think three quick sort of bottom line takeaways from the, from the wonderful lecture and the panel discussion tonight are, you know, first that particularly in the academic world, we're wowed by new discoveries. But tonight's lecture and your questions really underline the challenge Robin put in front of us, which is all the discoveries of the last hundred years are still only reaching a tiny percentage of India's population and of the world's population. So this century has to be one of innovating in delivery, of governance, of government, of private sector innovation, and of delivery. I think the second is around prevention, that health is not just about health care. It is about having a primary health care sector that works, but it's also the sanitation, the water, the literacy, nutrition, and that it needs to be brought together, and we mustn't get too sidetracked into just thinking about health care but come back to these major health issues so we don't end up in a very costly way treating diseases which could have been prevented if we'd got the basics uh, right and put them first. I think the third issue that comes out for me, listening to the panelists engage politely with one another and you with them, is that Robin's message that this is going to take collaboration, the public sector, private sector, social entrepreneurs, scientists all working together, ideally, yes, but there can be quite a lot of passing the buck. You know, no, that's for you to do. No, the difficult bit's for you to do. No, well, we're waiting for you. Well, no, you should fund that. No, you should fund that. And that, that collaboration actually is quite difficult to make happen. But I know the collective brains in this room will help make it happen over the, la over the next decade. And I look forward to watching that. And certainly from a school of government, supporting it in whatever way we can. So can you join me now in thanking the panelists, and particularly Robin Norton for a wonderful lecture, Mr. Harpal Singh, Mr. Keshav Dezeraju for bringing their time and wisdom to you this evening. Thank you very much.